Hey everyone, I'm really excited to be here at QCon New York. Thanks so much for coming along. So today we're going to talk about using chaos to build resilient systems. And you can find me on Twitter at Tammy Budo, and I work at Gremlin. So first off, I just wanted to ask a few questions um, to get to know you all a bit more. So first off, what's the scale of your infra? So can you tell me if you have like less than 100 hosts? A few people, yep. What about um, less than 1,000? Yep. And what about less than 10,000? What about more than 10,000? So we're like very varied audience. That's awesome. Good to hear. Thank you. Next up, I wanted to know, how many services do you have running in production? So who has like less than 20 services? A few people. Less than 100? Not a lot of people. Less than 500? OK. And who has more than like 1,000? So super varied again. <laughs> so that's like the really interesting thing actually to think about with chaos engineering. It's very different how you do it based on your own scale at your own company. Um, but I'm going to try and talk in a way that it helps everybody learn how you could apply chaos engineering when you go back to work. So the next question is, how many engineers do you have at your company? So who has like 10 engineers or less? A few people, yep. Yeah. What about, say, 50 engineers or less? Yep. Yeah. 100 or less? Who has like over 500? A lot of people. All right, cool. Good to know too. Super varied again. All right, so first off, this is what a common chaos engineering journey looks like. Usually I think people start out like similar to like riding a bike. There's like quite a few things that you need to learn before you can do chaos engineering. Just like you can't just hop on a bike and ride it immediately. Someone has to kind of explain to you what it's like. And then you have to try it yourself for real. You have to get some practical real life experience. But that's where you really start out. And for me, the hello world of chaos engineering is actually CPU attack. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. And after you've like learned to ride a bike and you're feeling pretty steady and you're going well, then like similar to life, you upgrade and you might learn to, ride a, to drive a car, right? That's like the next thing. And you like become pretty good at that. Maybe you even learn to drive a manual car or like in America it's like stick shift. Um, and then you're like, yeah, I can do this. This is awesome. Um, but there's a lot of skills to learn to be really good at that. And then with me, chaos engineering even goes further than that, where you get to really advanced chaos engineering, and it's like driving F1. Like, it's like driving a race car. There's a ton. So you can actually get amazing benefits, and you can get really big wins for your company, but you kind of have to know that it is a journey, and it could take you like a few years to become really great at chaos engineering. It's not something that just happens overnight. It's really a skill that you master over the years. And it also changes based on where you go and work, based on your infrastructure, how big your infra is, what services you're running. Uh, so just keep that in mind while we're talking about this. So I wanted to share, because we've been doing a lot of research over the last year. Um, and I, I first ran a chaos engineering boot camp back in June 2017. So it's been super interesting. I've had hundreds and hundreds of people, over 1,000 people come to those workshops in total. And they've got to run their first ever chaos engineering experiment. Um, a lot of people did that this week, which was great. Anna and I did that workshop. And I see like a few familiar faces, which is awesome. So thanks for coming along. Um, but I wanted to share like what are the top five most popular ways to apply chaos engineering in 2018. So often it's actually based on um, you can do chaos engineering on anything. So a lot of the time people will pick chaos engineering and apply it to a service. So the first one is actually Kubernetes. A lot of people are very interested in doing chaos engineering on Kubernetes, and they're actually practicing it right now in production. Does anyone want to guess what another one might be? What was that? Gremlin? You can definitely do chaos engineering on Gremlin. We do that. Every Friday, we do failure Fridays, but we also do chaos engineering on Gremlin every day, because obviously, we want to do that. Um, we make sure that our software is very resilient. Next one's Kafka. So a lot of people do chaos engineering on Kafka. When I worked at Dropbox, we did a lot of chaos engineering on Kafka. It was actually one of the first services that we picked because we noticed that there were quite a lot of reliability issues with Kafka. And it really depends on how you're running it within your own organization, how many engineers you have, how critical the data is. Next one's AWS ECS. So it's pretty new, um, but a lot of people are running ECS, and they're doing chaos engineering on that right now. I've heard a lot of people are interested in using EKS, the 
Elastic Kubernetes um, service, but right now a lot of people are using Elastic Container Service from AWS. Next one's Cassandra. So a lot of people actually are using Cassandra right now, and they're obviously concerned about reliability there and durability, data loss. So they do that. At Gremlin, we use DynamoDB, so we apply a lot of chaos engineering on Dynamo. And myself at Dropbox, I used to lead the databases team and also block storage. So there I would do chaos engineering on MySQL, and it was all bare metal. Um, and there was like many thousands of servers, um, like tens of thousands. So it's like really large scale. The last one is Elasticsearch. So this is another popular system to apply chaos engineering on. And you can see here, like a lot of these are super popular. Can you put your hand up if you're running one of these in production at your own company? Yeah, like everybody. <laughs> so that's really good to know too. So have a think about that too when you're thinking through this um, talk about how you could apply chaos engineering when you go back to work. It might be that you pick one of these services to do it on first. The other thing is I wanted to put this up front early so you understand like when you get to that F1 level where it's like you're driving the race car, this is more the advanced use of chaos engineering and it means that you're actually doing chaos engineering through your entire deployment pipeline. You could be doing it um, through build on every deploy, test, and then also in production. So every environment, um, for every single deployment for a service, you're going to be actually doing chaos engineering very frequently, every single day, not just once a quarter or once every few weeks, once a month, something like that. It's more that you do it every day and you're learning from it. Who's currently doing chaos engineering with your CI CD pipeline? Anybody? Ooh, we've got like two hands. That's very cool. So you're like, yeah, that's super advanced. Not many people in the world are doing that. So if you're doing that, you're really a pioneer in this space. So what happened this week? So I'll briefly mention this. We had like our June 2018 Slack outage. And I thought this was an interesting um, piece that came up on Hacker News. So it says, Google is an expert at designing services which you won't notice when there is downtime. Take Google Search, for example. When there's downtime, results might be less accurate or the parcel tracking box might not appear, or the page won't say the last visited time because of the search results, beside the search results. The SREs are running around fixing whatever system is down, but you probably won't notice as the user. Um, so that's really important when you think of chaos engineering and graceful degradation. And just a quote from Colton, who is our CEO, um, and testing those graceful degradations is actually where chaos engineering comes in. So you can make sure that if failure strikes, you're prepared, and you can actually see what the graceful degradation will look like to your customers, not only from the system level, but actually in the UI, like that Hacker News quote says in terms of what the Google search results look like in the UI. So that's a good thing to remember. And Colton previously worked at Netflix, where he built Fit, um, and he also worked at Amazon, with, where he built other chaos engineering tooling. So he's done that at a few companies, and now he's um, created Gremlin, which is where I am at. It's very exciting. But yeah. Here's an example of what graceful degradation looks like for Netflix. So say, for example, at the top level, the top image, you can see that there's like this hero banner and it has something featured. It's like, hey, watch this. It's really popular right now. It's new. Check it out. But what happens if there's something wrong with that box? What happens if it's not streaming well at the moment, that featured movie or, or um, TV show? What happens if the image isn't loading properly? If there's an issue with the CDN? Well, what graceful degradation means is that you catch that issue and you gracefully remove the hero image. Instead of having like, you know, some sort of ugly looking UI, you just completely get rid of it, and that's what the bottom image looks like, where it's just totally removed. So that's chaos engineering when you actually apply it to the UI, and you can see it's quite different, because you need to actually be working with UI engineers, your design team, your product engineering team, um, you need to be working with product managers, so it's really this idea of full stack chaos engineering, um, and you're thinking about the customer and what you want them to see. Totally different. And this is also very new. A lot of people aren't really doing this either. So just a little bit of a background about me. Um, I've been causing chaos in production since 2009. I first started doing chaos engineering at the National Australia Bank. 
Uh, back then, we would often be injecting failure because you have a lot of things that you need to look after when you work in finance or banking. Um, I was working on an acquisition company, which had, it was a mortgage processing company, and the bank had acquired it. need to be super reliable because you're processing mortgages, which are often around a million dollars each, and you make quite a lot of money per mortgage, so you care about every single transaction. Every single one needs to be processed and in a very fast amount of time because if you don't process it fast, then someone else will process it and then they'll get the mortgage instead. Or even worse, somebody went to an auction, they like put up their hand to get their dream home, they only put it through your mortgage broking service, you don't process it in time because you're, maybe you have a delay or an outage and take several hours and they miss out on getting their dream home. That's really bad, but then also because of there's some issues in terms of regulation. They can then call up the regulators, regulators and actually fine you as an engineer. So I do have like fines against my name for causing outages and stopping mortgage breaking systems from working. So that's like the real life impact of downtime when you're an engineer working in finance. I didn't realize that was going to happen to me. I think I'd started working after university and um, yeah, suddenly someone sent me an email. I was like, oh, Tammy, you just got fined by the regulators. Now you're on record for this outage. I'm like, whoa, okay, this is serious. Um, so yeah, you definitely want to care a lot about reliability when you're working on those systems. But for me, I care about reliability working on every system that I'm working on because I think it is really important. Then when I was working at Dropbox, we did a lot of chaos engineering there too. So for the databases, for block storage, block storage in Dropbox is called Magic Pocket. And there was a big migration to move from S3 to our own internal block storage, which was built in house. Um, and we would do actually chaos engineering every single week, multiple times. And the reason there is because on-call is super low. It's like you pretty much never get paged because it's, super, it's a very resilient system. But the thing there is if you never get paged, how do you know what to do when you get paged one day, right? Especially if you're onboarding new engineers, you need them to learn what to do if something goes wrong. So we use chaos engineering to trigger failure, to make sure that all of our alerting worked correctly, monitoring worked correctly, to do things like DNS failover, often in staging, which was actually dog fooded by employees. So you actually are injecting it into their environments and making sure that you catch everything. And the big thing with chaos engineering is you're not trying to impact the customer in a bad way. You don't do things that are dangerous. You're just trying to learn about your system and you think a lot about blast radius. So start small and then gradually increase. Um, and then I also led the code workflows team, which is all of the internal tooling for developers. So there's 800 engineers at Dropbox, a bit more now. And um, yeah, so we did actually chaos engineering there, trying to think how can we make the systems more reliable for the engineers? Because you don't want engineers to not be coding and not have access to their systems and not have access to dev and test. Because say if they lose like a day or two a week, that's like really hard when you're trying to build new products and ship features. Uh, so you can think a lot about injecting failure at every single level and every environment that you have at your company. You'll get awesome results. I actually got a 10x reduction in incidents in three months. Um, so I feel like chaos engineering can be like a really fast, effective way to reduce incidents. And also I had a 12-month um, period of time with no high severity outages, whereas before that there was quite a few. So just a little bit about Gremlin. We're practitioners of chaos engineering. We build software that helps engineers build resilient systems in a safe, secure, and simple way. Uh, we offer 11 different ways to inject chaos for your chaos engineering experiments. You can inject it at the host level or the container level. And we do things like packet loss, shutdown, if you've heard of Chaos Monkey, that's one of the attacks that we have. And the way that you roll out Gremlin is it's an agent that runs on your host or inside a container. Uh, similar to how you'd roll out something like Datadog or New Relic. So really easy to get started. That's all you have to do. You don't need to change your code. You don't need to make any changes to your infrastructure except just rolling out the agent. So now let's get started in the world of chaos engineering. Part one, laying the foundation. So first off, let's define a resilient system. I like to say that it's a highly available and durable system. Often we don't talk about durability, and by that I just mean we don't want to lose data, um, especially if we have very important data. So availability and durability. A resilient system can maintain an acceptable level of service in the face of failure. So thinking about things like graceful degradation. A resilient system can weather the storm, whether that's a misconfiguration, a large-scale natural disaster, or controlled chaos engineering. And I like to say this too. 
when you think about how do you do things at work and do them really well as an engineer. It would be silly to give an Olympic pole vaulter a broom and ban them from practicing, right? Like you need to have the right tools, you need to have the time to practice. The best way to be great at handling issues and problems is to actually know what it feels like and get that right experience. But if you don't have the right tools, you don't have the right access, you don't have the right support from your company, it makes it really difficult. So it's pretty important to actually um, communicate when you're trying to do chaos engineering to let people know this is why I want to do it, these are the results that I'm going to try and get, like I want to get an X percent reduction in incidents or I want to reduce outages by this many or I want to reduce downtime by this much. Focus more on the results that you want to actually achieve and then explain what kind of things you need to make it happen. And we like to define chaos engineering like this. Thoughtful planned experiments designed to reveal the weaknesses in our systems. So really simple, not random, not chaotic, but very thoughtful, a very scientific approach. And we also like to say that you should think of it like a vaccination. So inject something harmful in order to build an immunity. And we all know that eventually our systems are going to break in many undesired ways. So we break them first on purpose with controlled chaos. Who here does dog fooding? Few people. Cool. So I'll just explain it a bit more. So dog fooding is when you actually use your new use your product internally before you give it to your customers. So you'll be trying out new features, or you'll be all using the staging environment of your product. Um, so for example, at Dropbox for Dropbox Paper, you're dog fooding Dropbox Paper on stage instead of um, using the production version. Version. So then you're trying all the newest stuff, and yeah, like you you see all the things that might not work. So it's actually really good. Um, and then for us at Gremlin, that means that we use Gremlin for our own chaos engineering experiments. We're always dog food in Gremlin ourselves. We also do something called Failure Fridays. So this is where we actually get together for a few hours. Our entire company hops onto a VC call because we're really remotely distributed. And we'll actually do a bunch of different chaos engineering experiments. Sometimes we decide to focus on DynamoDB. We've also done chaos engineering on React, which is really interesting. One of our UI engineers recently wrote um, a paper, which you can find on gremlin.com, about injecting failure in terms of React, which is quite cool. Who here is using React? Yeah, like lots of people, quite a few. So yeah, it's pretty popular at the moment. Good thing to think about with your chaos engineering. Who here does something like failure Fridays or game days? Anybody do anything like that? Yeah, a few hands, not many. So yeah, it's a pretty new topic um, for a lot of people, but it's a really great thing to do. Happens a lot at places like Google, Netflix, Dropbox. And it's just dedicated time to get together, to collaborate, and focus on chaos engineering practices to reveal the weaknesses in your services. You see a ton of things. You're going to spot issues with your monitoring, issues with your alerting. You'll all learn something new. It's also a great way to show people if you've recently built a new service, it's a great um, piece of a way to train people and explain to them, hey, we're going to roll this out. Let's all do some chaos engineering on it right now. Everyone can ask questions. You have, we have like a dedicated Slack channel, so you can pop in there and ask any questions. You can also file bugs really easily if you spot something that doesn't work. And it's good too because you'll have like, say for us, 30 people would jump on and be doing all types of different chaos engineering experiments. We usually actually just have a simple spreadsheet and write the experiments that we're running ourselves so we can track them and see which ones passed or failed. So why do distributed systems need chaos in the first place? Usually it's really hard to debug failures, um, especially these days. With, if you have tons of microservices, it's really hard to debug those problems. Um, systems and companies are scaling rapidly, so it's not only the fact that you have a lot of services, it also could be that you have a lot of customers and you're scaling really fast. For example, when I was working at Dropbox, we went from 400 million users to 500 million users in one year. So that's 100 million extra users, and you can imagine how much that actually changes what you need to do in terms of your infrastructure. It's very different. Things, you have to think about things like capacity planning, load, like how you're going to service all these users, where are they located, all of these different things. But that's actually a really important thing to think about too, scale. And it really helps you learn along the way. I always feel like when you're an SRE, especially at a company that's growing super fast, um, people say that it's like, you know, you hop on the rocket ship and you're like on the rocket ship flying through the air. But I always felt like it was more like you're on the outside of the rocket ship, like trying to fix it while it's flying. <laughs> that to me is more like being an SRE. 
And I mentioned this a little bit before, but there is this new concept of full stack chaos engineering, the fact that you can actually apply chaos engineering at any layer of the stack. The API, that's a really new one. Who here has had an API-related outage? <laughs> like a lot of people, it's very common. Um, and often I feel like infrastructure engineers don't advise when a new API is being built. Um, and often it might be like product engineering and infra engineering, if you have those teams, could work together more to actually build more resilient APIs. Um, but you can actually do API-related injection, which is quite cool, but super new concept. And then that lets you learn things about rate limiting, throttling, and other types of issues, error messages, error codes. I know myself when I've done integrations with third-party APIs, that can be quite hard too, right? Say if you at your company need to use 100 plus APIs, maybe use PayPal, maybe use Stripe, maybe use some other type of service like a weather API if you have a product that needs to get that sort of data. Then you can think about third-party APIs and the chaos for that. What's your fallback? How do you know if it's broken? Um, how does your entire team handle those issues? The other layers are like things like your application layer, your cache. I've done a lot of chaos engineering on memcache. Um, say, for example, like who here has seen an, an outage when the cache got taken down and hammered the database? Anybody? I've seen that a ton of times. Yeah, a few people. Um, so the other one is database-related chaos engineering. I've done quite a lot with MySQL and now DynamoDB OS level, so Linux, um, your actual host networking, power, and more, like every single layer. The UI as well. So why do we run these chaos engineering experiments? There's a few key questions that I like to ask, and this is especially if you want to try and advocate for chaos engineering at your um, place that you work, but people are like, what? Why do you want to break things on purpose? That sounds dangerous. Uh, what are you talking about? And often people might be scared, especially if you say this and it's like the sales team gets really worried and thinks you're trying to break things for the customer, so you need to really explain it. One of the key things to say is, are you confident that your metrics and alerting are as good as they should be? So I call this like your pager pain. Um, are you really confident and everything's good? Do you have legacy or technical debt in terms of your dashboards, your alerts, the thresholds for your alerts? I'm sure there's probably some things you could clean up. And I haven't yet met many people that do alert auditing or dashboard auditing. It's not super common. Um, I guess it happens at bigger places like Google, but that's a very important practice which you can actually do chaos engineering to identify those issues and get rid of them. The next question would be, are you confident that your customers are getting as good an experience as they could be? So customer pain, um, do you know how, how ha much harm your customers are experiencing? Do you have a really good relationship with your support team? Are you able to pick up what those issues are? I think when we work at big organizations, it's hard to see that visibility. If you're at a smaller startup, you can really feel it and you know every single issue, um, but as you scale, it becomes harder. And are you losing money due to downtime and broken features? So this can be a big one. If you have a lot of downtime, then you're losing money already. Um, and also your users might just decide to leave you because you have so much downtime that they just aren't happy at all to be your customer. So now, how do you actually run the experiments? Let's go into the technical details. So the first one is it's really a scientific approach. So the first thing you need to do is form a hypothesis. Then you need to consider the blast radius. So start small, gradually expand. Then you want to run your experiment. You want to measure the results. And then you want to find and fix the issues, or you can actually scale your chaos engineering and increase the blast radius. An important thing to do, actually, as well, is you need to make sure you have some baseline metrics. Um, often we forget to do that, but that's super important. Before you run your experiment, make sure that you actually are collecting data. Um, the other message is, like, please don't run before you can walk. It's totally OK to start slow with this, because it can be quite dangerous, so you don't want to go too fast. And there are actually three prerequisites of chaos engineering. Um, the first one's monitoring and observability. I've actually met a lot of people who have, like, you know, not a very good um, setup for their monitoring. Some people are using, like, four different monitoring services, but all of the data across all the different services is in different monitoring systems. It's very important if you're going to be doing chaos engineering that you at least have one central monitoring service that has all of your critical systems data in there so that anyone across the company at any time that needed to know about reliability could look in that one system and see that data. And in terms of observability, that's just an extra toolkit that's going to give you so much more insight in what you need to learn um, about your chaos engineering experiments and about your systems and services. Who here is like, happy with their monitoring 
um, set up right now. Yeah, like I usually see like one or two people that you're like, uh, not really. Um, so yeah, I think it's actually super important to fix that first. Um, and there are a lot of great monitoring providers out there, so it's definitely something we can do better at, and I feel like it's something we should do better at. The next one is on-call and incident management. So this is very important. I've actually met quite a lot of people over the last year that don't have any type of alerting set up, and they're manually watching dashboards. That's very bad. Um, so you want to be using some on-call alerting software, something like PagerDuty, VictorOps. You know, there are a lot of providers that you can use. And the other thing is having an incident management program. So this is about being able to say, this is a really high severity incident. We need to let the CTO know because it's super bad. Because otherwise, you're just getting too many noisy pages, and you're treating everything at the same level. And that just ends up in burnout because people get too many pages, and you're not able to actually triage issues properly. So very important to have like a proper incident management program. At Dropbox, I was an IMOC, which is an incident manager on call. And there was five of those people um, across the company. We worked on any of the high severity outages. And it's a 24-7 rotation. You do it once every five weeks. And you get paid for any SEV0, which is like the biggest like major catastrophic incident, or a SEV1. And you hop on, and you are like the commander that's responsible for communicating with the CTO, communicating with the CEO, making sure that the PR team knows what they need to say, making sure the status page gets updated. If the media is asking questions, the PR team will work with them. Uh, so that's very important to have this like commander role. And the other thing is it helps make sure that engineers are able to focus on the technical resolution and not having to answer all those questions that are really like annoying when you're like actually trying to debug the issue. Um, so it separates the two roles out. Super important, and it's a pretty small change. The last one is know your cost of downtime. And this is very hard. You need to actually go find like your CFO, um, your finance team, and try and talk to them and say, hey, like, how much would it cost if we were down for an hour? Like, do you know? If they don't know, like, give them some time to figure it out, but let them know that it would be super helpful if you actually knew how much downtime costs. And then you need to think about other things too. If you have downtime for an hour, then you have a post-mortem process, and you have like 30 people in the post-mortem room, then you also have to do some action items, and that takes you a month to do all of those action items, like code fixes, changes. You have to calculate that cost in of people's time. So what do I use for monitoring and observability? At the moment, I use Datadog. Um, I use that right now at Gremlin. Also Sentry, old school Wireshark, still using that um, for networking. And we all need to know the cost of downtime. Here's an example from British Airways. They said that a power outage cost them 80 million pounds. There was, they had an outage for a few hours one day. Um, and yeah, they had like cancellation of flights. People couldn't be rebooked. They actually lost 80 million pounds. That's a ton of money just for an outage for one day. And I actually wrote about how you could establish your own high severity incident management program if you don't have one. You can check this out. I tried to make it actually pretty simple for a way that you could do it. You don't need to have too many things. I think the most important thing is having this IMOC rotation. If you have a company of like 10 engineers, you could have one IMOC because you're not going to have as many outages, hopefully. But as your scale grows, then you might want to have a few. Say if you've got like 1,000 engineers, then you might have five IMOCs or four IMOCs. You don't need a ton. And then you have the technical lead on call who is actually the service area lead, the person who's just on call for that service. The IMOC is actually responsible for finding that person. Because you know how sometimes you have an outage where you're like, well, I got paged, but just getting symptom pages um, and I'm like, I think something's not working, like the database isn't working or the cache isn't working, but it's not actually your system that's causing the problems. So that's why you actually need to find the person whose system is causing the majority of the problems, and then it's creating this like cascading failure across your entire infrastructure. The IMOC can help you find them. If you're alerting and incident management um, and paging isn't working so good and you're monitoring, but sometimes it isn't perfect, you know, we need to constantly improve. So how do you choose what you're going to do first for your chaos engineering experiment? Um, who here knows what your top five critical systems are at your own company? Yeah, wow, a few hands. That's actually pretty good. Usually people aren't really sure what the top five systems are. Um, so say it could actually be pretty, um, you could think about it like this. At your storage layer or your data layer, you might have something like a database like MySQL, DynamoDB, Cassandra. Maybe you also have a caching layer. Usually those will be one of your critical services. Um, but if you have a giant company with like many, many products that you offer, then you probably have to break it down even more and just focus on one product area. 
Like for example, you might just say Google search. What are the top five critical systems there? Then you want to choose one of those systems. Then the next thing is to actually whiteboard that system as a team. So get together in a room and have say like 10 to 15 engineers who are really interested in doing this, who want to work with you, and get them to whiteboard it out. The next thing is select an attack. Often like it is good to start at something like CPU attack, um, or you could do something like latency injection. Then determine the scope of the attack. And when we think about what we should measure before doing a chaos engineering experiment, you want to be measuring things like availability, service-specific KPIs, and by that I mean something like latency or for a database like QPS, queries per second, um, for a cache like cache hit rate, things like that. You want those service-specific KPIs. Then you want to also have your system metrics be measured and customer complaints. And the thing here is you're measuring this because if you inject that failure, you want to make sure that you can actually catch it and that's like testing your monitoring and alerting. Because how do you know if your monitoring and alerting really works if you never actually test it? Like, who monitors the monitoring? We also wrote a ton of cool resources. So, you know, you could take this back to your work next week and say that you want to plan your own game day. Um, so we've got a ton here. There's like an agenda, an execution template, a recording template. Um, this is by HML and Eugene. They created these and put them up on gremlin.com slash game day. One of the examples is a diagram like this, which talks about, um, it's, it's how you can figure out the blast radius of your first chaos engineering experiment. So you want to think about something like on the bottom, number of hosts. How many hosts are you going to impact for this experiment? And then across the left, that is latency. So how much latency are you going to inject in milliseconds? You know, usually you definitely want to start small. Small number of hosts, small amount of latency that you inject. And then you look at things like, can we catch this in our dashboard? Can we catch this with our monitoring and alerting? You would say something like, our hypothesis is, you know, Gary's going to get paged because he's on call right now. Um, and if we go at, to, at this point, then he's going to get paged. The other thing that's important is to always have the ability to stop all chaos engineering experiments. Um, so that's very important as well in case something goes wrong. So here's an example system. Say we have a Kubernetes retail store. There's a lot of different ways that you could inject chaos engineering here. We could do something like kill one of the nodes, or we could inject packet loss into one of the nodes, or latency, or we could kill a process, check that it respawns, or maybe instead what you do at your company is what we did at Dropbox. If, say, MySQL D died and was killed, then we just want to get rid of that machine because it's kind of like infected and it's a bad host now. So we just chuck it out of the fleet entirely and make sure that a new one pops back in, a new clone. That's very important. Um, and I think that's a good way to manage your fleet so you have like a healthy fleet. Because usually, like we all know, that as soon as your, healthy, your fleet is unhealthy, old kernel, old operating system, bad configuration, like that's when you start to see problems always. So you want to keep your fleet healthy and upgraded. Um, you could also do some chaos engineering on the primary. You could kill the primary, um, and then because you're running Kubernetes, it should be replaced. I do a lot of um, chaos engineering on Kubernetes in the chaos engineering boot camp that I run, which you can find on my GitHub, just github.com slash Tammy Buto. Um, I do that with Anna, and it's very interesting because you will see a lot of issues with Kubernetes when you inject network-related attacks, tons of issues, and we're like just starting to explore it. Um, so it would be great if other people started to get in there and ran some um, attacks as well and some experiments. But a good thing to do too is to say, hey, like there's a new version of Kubernetes. Before we run it in production, we're going to actually do our set of chaos engineering experiments on it and make sure that that all works well. Um, and it's super important too, even if you're using something like AWS. I know recently AWS rolled out a new version of Amazon RDS MySQL, and that caused like actually a bunch of outages um, and some pretty big problems. So, you know, you can't 100% trust it, even if it's somebody else that's running it for you and you think that you should be able to trust it. There's always problems that can occur. Always important to have backups and the ability to restore. Oh, and the other thing you can do for this, too, is UI-related chaos engineering. So if you're running a retail store, you can do things like impact the shopping cart, impact the payments processing. Say if you end up doing something like personal recommendations with machine learning, you can like end up killing um, your training clusters, see how long it takes you to create a new one. If your backup process works well, you can really inject chaos everywhere and learn from it. So now let's talk about resource chaos engineering. 
We can increase CPU, disk, I.O. and memory consumption to ensure that our monitoring can catch our problems. And it's really important to catch those problems before they turn into high severity incidents, like your customers not being able to purchase new products, and also downtime for customers. One of the things that you'll notice, this is something to expect when you start to do chaos engineering, is that you'll have a decrease in high severity outages if you're doing it well. You'll have a decrease in sev zeros and sev ones, but you'll actually probably have an increase in sev threes or sev twos because you'll be catching the problems before they turn into major outages. That's actually what I've noticed has happened to me over the last 10 years. You'll always get an increase in those lower severity issues. And then eventually, like those will also um, become less and less over time, but that's what happens first. So CPU chaos. I actually have got a GitHub repo where you can see how to do some CPU chaos. If you just go to github.com slash tamibuto slash chaos engineering bootcamp, um, you could run that. And this is like a known known experiment. That's why it's a hello world. You're not doing anything super complicated here. You're just injecting CPU related chaos. It's more of the bicycle. Just get started. Super easy to run. I encourage you to do it on a demo environment first. This is definitely not a production tool. This is more just to learn. And then you'll end up that it looks, you'll see that it looks like this, some chaos in top. And then what you can do is you can just kill it, um, pkill-u chaos. And this is also another way to do chaos engineering. This is killing a process, so just pkill. Um, you could kill a different process. For example, we used to kill MySQL D using pkill. There I'm killing anything run under the chaos user, which is why it's dash u. So no more chaos in top now. Everything's gone because I'm not running any experiments under that user. And the reason that I do it under I killing, I'm killing everything under chaos is because I'm using that as my chaos user, which is like a pretty clean way to do these experiments in a demo environment. They're all attached to the one user, and you immediately kill all of them. Disk chaos. So he here has had disk-related issues, like logs backing up. Yeah, like everybody. <laughs> so um, yeah, if you want to be able to check in advance, like what is our disk at right now, then you could inject some disk-related chaos. You could fill up the logs on, say, um, a replica, a primary, and see if you catch it. This is like a very common thing, right, that happens a lot. And the other thing that I think is important to think about is using your knowledge that you pick up of chaos engineering and all of the outages and issues you've experienced in the past, use all of that to actually teach like new engineers. Because um, I think there's a lot of things where we've all been burned in the same way, but maybe you can like prevent them from getting burned in the same way. Like, uh, especially these days, I think we don't often do a lot of knowledge transfer to the new engineers. Hey, you're probably going to have like logs back up one day, um, and this is how you can spot that before it happens. This is how you can prevent it from happening. Memory-related chaos is another one. So here we're just checking to see like what is the memory that we have. Um, very easy to then inject memory-related chaos, but it's just another one of the things that we can look at in terms of resources. What if we're running out of memory? What's going on? We need to debug it. We need to be able to catch it. You want your whole team to be prepared to handle that if it does happen, especially if it gets spread across your fleet in some way and there's many, many machines that are impacted and infected with an issue. So the next is state chaos engineering. So the first one is process chaos. There are ways to create, um, many ways to create process chaos on purpose. One is kill one process. One is loop kill a process, um, spawn new processes, and fork bomb. Like I've definitely seen a lot of issues where like suddenly processes start to spawn by accident across like production, and then you have to do some sort of like production patch to stop that from occurring. I'm like, see a few heads nodding. It's like a, a nightmare situation, but it does happen. Uh, so you can see a lot of issues with new processes. And we have our tools, like I showed you before, pkill-u chaos is a form of just killing a process. Then there's also shutdown. And a lot of the time we think this is quite simple, just shutting down a server. Like, sounds pretty easy. But there are a lot of different ways that you can cause shutdown chaos. So the first one is just shutdown-h, where you're just shutting down your instance or your machine. But there are many other ways to turn off a server. There are different commands um, that you can use. And also, what happens if you actually want to do something quite good to keep your fleet clean? Like, what if you want to turn off every server when it's a week old or a month old um, and remove it from your fleet? 
there are some good ideas around that. But then obviously you need to have very nice algorithms to make sure you're not shutting off like a ton of servers from the same service um, or a ton at the same time across many services. Because I always say like, I don't want you to go into work tomorrow or next week and say like, let's take down the data center <laughs> because you're probably not ready for that. <laughs> So the other ways to do shutdown could be halt, reboot, power off, um, and they're all really different. You know, like I used to see a lot of issues when I was working at DigitalOcean. Um, I was I worked there back in 2014, and uh, we used to see people doing a lot of interesting things, especially with power off. It can actually cause quite a bit of problems. And DigitalOcean has like 14 data centers around the world, many many thousands of servers, so you're looking after a lot of infrastructure. Um, but if you try all of these different ways to do shutdown attacks, you'll notice like they're all pretty different and people could get really stuck. The customers would have a lot of issues. Some can cause corruption, all types of things. And then what about shutting down containers and K8's pods? Um, so it's not just shutting down a host. So Chaos Monkey would do like shut down a host on EC2, but then there's also like shut down one container, um, shut down a pod. And you can do this in many different ways. There are many ways to kill containers. This is just a short little bit of what I thought of now, but there's even more. So one is you could actually hop on a container and kill it itself. Or what you could do is you could kill a container from the host. Um, you could use one container to kill another container. You could use one container to kill several containers. Or you could use several containers to kill several other containers. And when you start to think about this, this is like thinking about things like um, noisy neighbor container related issues. Say if one container takes out a ton of other containers on your host, what if that happens? Um, or if you know, a few containers take out a few other containers. You want to be able to make sure you can catch that. And I've done all of these different experiments. It's really interesting. You need to have like, very good monitoring to catch these um, to make sure that you're able to actually observe what's going on in detail. And the idea of doing this too is you know, usually when you're running at scale, you don't care if like one container goes down because that's pretty normal. But when you're doing chaos engineering, the idea is to be very specific and focused so you can learn from it. And then you'll be more confident at scale. And the average lifespan of a container is 2.5 days and they fail in many unexpected ways. Next one, time travel chaos. So this is like clock skew and this is definitely a common issue still. Um, I would see people have problems with this all the time when I was at DigitalOcean. And you think of things like Y2K. Back when Y2K happens, there was like so much news in the media. Everyone was really worried. If you wanted, you could have just done a chaos engineering experiment to change the clock time and be like, oh, we're going to be fine. No worries. Networking, chaos engineering is the last one. So this is black hole. So you could do something like black hole a service. Um, sometimes that's a really interesting one to do. The other thing you can do is DNS-related chaos. We all know about this big Dyn cyber attack outage um, 2016, where like a lot of the internet went down. You could easily reproduce that using Gremlin with like a few clicks. You can create a DNS attack um, and make that happen again and check that you're OK if your DNS failed. Latency chaos, so just injecting some chaos and then being able to check that you can find that latency issue. And then packet loss. And it's really interesting here, if you inject like 10% of packet loss, what happens? And then you gradually go higher and higher, like 50%, especially if you do it on Kubernetes. Pretty interesting demo to do for yourself to start. There are many complex outages that happen. Um, they're never really simple. There's always cascading failure. So we can combine different types of chaos engineering experiments to reproduce really complicated outages and make sure that we can handle them. This is really good, too, if you're very worried about something that's occurred multiple times, especially if you keep having the same outage repeat itself, which definitely happens. Um, I've seen that happen to me everywhere I've worked. And it gives you the confidence to handle it. So let's go back in time and just look at a few short, very bad outage stories that actually kicked off the introduction of chaos engineering. One is Dropbox's worst outage ever back in 2014. This is a database-related um, outage. Some master replica pairs were impacted during an upgrade process. So it was just a very simple process to upgrade the machine's operating system, but accidentally some of the machines were upgraded that shouldn't have been. Then Chaos Engineering was introduced at Dropbox. This is Uber's biggest one. Master log replication to S3 failed. This is a pretty bad outage, very bad. Logs backed up on the primary. Alerts fired to the engineer, but they ignored them. The disk filled up on the primary. And then the engineer deleted the unarchived wall files. And error in config prevented promotion. So super bad, but you could easily reproduce that with chaos engineering to make sure that you were prepared if it ever happened. 
outages happen, I noticed a lot of them are actually database related. So that's definitely a good area to focus on when doing chaos engineering experiments. And you can find a lot of postmortems up here. So how can you continue your chaos engineering journey? You can definitely join the chaos Slack. This is a public Slack. There's over a thousand engineers in here from companies all over the world. Um, Gremlin.com slash Slack, hop in there. Ask questions, learn from each other. The next one is you can learn from the Gremlin community. We've got a ton of interesting tutorials up here um, where you can actually learn to do practical hands-on chaos engineering. And then come to Chaos Conf, which is the first ever chaos engineering conference. It's gonna be in San Francisco, um, chaosconf.io. So one whole day, single track, um, yeah. And thank you so much for having me.